Over the next few sessions, uh, I would like us to um, explore some of the attitudinal foundations of mindfulness. Um, and um, the, 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 the kind of rationale behind this is that um, uh, perhaps it's a, it's a core uh, tenet of mindfulness training that the attitude that we take towards our experience co-creates the experience. So um, what that means in simple terms is that, that how we meet what happens to us changes what happens to us in that moment. Um, meeting an experience with a uh, sense of care, kindness, gentleness, it's very different from if we meet the same experience with resistance and struggle. Uh, so even though we may not be able to change the immediate circumstances that we find ourselves in, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's axiomatic that we can't because what's here is already happening and has been created by a variety of now unchangeable causes and conditions. Kind of how we've ended up right now is, is it is, is, is already here. However, we have the, um, the possibility of choosing how we meet it. As long as we have some sense of how to do that. Um, and this is this is really where mindfulness training comes in is that it seems to be that we can practice uh, shifting our, uh, our attitude and our capacity for shifting our attitude. Um, if we train ourselves to do so over and over. And, and so the question then becomes, okay, well, what kind of, what kind of attitudes are supportive to our, our well-being and our um, capacity to live skillfully and compassionately? Uh, and so uh, there are a number of, of these qualities and some will be very familiar to you. For example, patience, trust, commitment, um, curiosity or beginner's mind, as it's sometimes known. And maybe we'll have a look at these um, over the course of, of future sessions. For this evening, I wanted to, to kind of look at you know, what might be called one of the big ones, um, which, is, which is letting go or letting be. Sounds really simple uh, and isn't. Um, I, I remember um, in uh, kind of the early days of my, um, actually before I learned to meditate, uh, when I was in a um, kind of in a in a, a place of great confusion, I was kind of a very anxious and depressed, um, and was sort of stuck in that. Um, stuck in that kind of zone for quite a long time. And I remember somebody saying to me, in fact, I'm sure more than one person said to me, um, Ed, you just need to let go. And of course, I'd, I'd want to punch them. Um, because, you know, it's like, well, that's easy for you to say. But how on earth does, you know, how on earth can I let go of something that I didn't even know I was, well, maybe I was beginning to know that I was attached to. But, um, but didn't know how not to be attached to all sorts of things because I was kind of stuck to everything. Um, and that's just how I'd lived my life up until that point. And nobody had really pointed out that there was a possibility of being any other way. Um, and yet when it happens, letting go is a bit like, um, uh, it's a bit like finding your keys, kind of, you know, you look around and then you see them, see them over kind of underneath the sofa. Of course, that's where they were. Yeah, that's I, I dropped them earlier, didn't I? They were there all along, you know. It's just I've been looking in the wrong places. And uh, and that's what I found with letting go is is that once I had an experience of letting go, uh, then kind of at last I knew at least what it felt like, kind of what to cultivate. Um, and when I did, and this was, by the way, after I'd learned to meditate, and it really was for me anyway, meditation that was the tool that, that showed me the possibility of what, 
what letting go might feel like or be like or even look like. Uh, I guess the first real experience of letting go I had was, was, was being able to recognize that um, I didn't have to follow every thought that I had. They could be let go of. Not that they disappear, because I think I probably had an idea like many people that letting go meant that something would go away, like letting go. But that's not letting go, that's getting rid. Um, and um, the phrase isn't making go, it's letting go. So inherent in that is, is a willingness for something to be here. So letting go doesn't mean that something disappears. It's a letting go of our relationship to it from the usual one of this, grasp, hold, or sometimes this, push away, into, um, into a kind of a, a willingness to be with, to open-handedly experience what's happening moment by moment without grasping or pushing. But kind of more of a holding and an allowing. So it's not like a so much as a drop as a kind of a an open palm hold. Um, <clears throat> and it takes practice, a lot of practice, <laughs> a really lot of practice. But it can, it can and does happen. And, um, you know, if you're into this kind of thing, then you could look at some of the neuroscience studies, which show that people who've um, practiced meditation for a long time, uh, the regions of their, of their brain um, that process emotions um, have a different quality to them. So there's less activity in what's called the default mode network which is the network that tends to be active when we're thinking about ourselves, or caught in stories. Um, and um, there's a kind of a deconnectivity of that network with the, with the area of the brain that, f that feels emotions or is, is, is um, what's the word, um, congruent with feeling emotions. So what seems to happen when people practice is those two areas of the brain are decoupled so it's not that people who practice mindfulness are somehow emotionless, that, you know, we don't experience sadness or, or disappointment or anger, but that um, our attachment to it is less. There's less of a story going on, less of a narrative that keeps it going, less of a sense of it being me who's angry or sad. And that seems to maybe allow the emotion to flow through. There's less resistance to it. There's less holding on to it. So the decoupling of those areas of the brain are correlated with um, practitioners reporting that, for example, they become less angry for less long or less sad for less long when difficult things arise than people who were um, novice meditators. That's just one example of how this, how this plays out. But there's a kind of a, um, there's a stickiness. In fact, Richie Davidson calls it effective stickiness. You know, we get kind of stuck into our emotions and our, our mood states and our reactions um, in a way that actually keeps them perpetuating over um, and over and over. But the more that we can practice unhanding our experiences, a sense of, of kind of opening to them without making them all of who I am. We recognize that they're a part of who we are, but they're not the whole of who we are. Um, then we are moving into the territory of letting go. And I don't know about you, but when, when, um, when I'm able to relate to experiences like this, it can feel wonderful. It can feel spacious. It can feel, um, kind of powerful as well in the sense that of kind of not being caught in the, the habit of, of reactivity. And I'm not going to, you know, pretend to you that, that, um, you know, anybody, I, anybody that I know can do this all the time, or certainly not with the, you know, we all have our particular things that we're attached to, don't we? You know, <laughs> kind of that are really, you know, it might be easy for somebody else to, 
not be attached to that thing, but hey, I certainly am, you know, and, um, you know, that's, that's a domain of practice, but we can kind of move in the direction where more and more of our lives becomes possible to experience with, with a lightness. Um, whether it's aging or um, kind of uh, difficult relationships, the past, kind of ideas of the past or concerns about the future, the possibility that we can, we can, by coming back to the experience of the present moment, which inherently is not grasped to because it's continually shifting and it's also in another sense, timeless, because there's no past or future in the present moment. There are just ideas about them. If we can touch into that again and again and again and again, we're already kind of practicing this letting go, the sense of resting in the flow of, of experience. But it is true that, you know, much of our, much of our culture and our lives are not set up that way. Um, they kind of set up to encourage us to, you know, deny our impermanence and the impermanence of everything else around us. Um, you know, to grasp, to push and pull. Um, and there may be some short term kind of gains in that, you know, it's a bit like a bit like with a, an addiction, there's a short term fix. You know, maybe we feel a bit more secure in the short term, until of course, whatever we love and have held on to is taken away from us. Um, or until we find ourselves seemingly stuck with someone we don't want, something or someone we don't want. So kind of the long-term benefit maybe, maybe requires a short-term uh, difficulty of actually practicing this letting go, going against the grain of, of grasp and clench and um, you know, push away. I'd like to read you just a little story that I like. Um, I'll read it to you. It's one from one of Jack Cornfield's books. It's from A Path with Heart, which is a wonderful book if you ever get a chance to read it. There's an old story about a famous rabbi living in Europe who was visited one day by a man who had traveled by ship from New York to see him. The man came to the great rabbi's dwelling, a large house on a street in a European city was directed to the rabbi's room, which was in the attic. He entered to find the master living in a room with a bed, a chair, and a few books. The man had expected much more. After greetings, he said, Rabbi, where are your things? The rabbi asked in return, well, where are yours? His visitor replied, but Rabbi, I'm only passing through. And the master answered, so am I, so am I. So let's um let's drop into a practice together.